Wow, that was awesome, amen? Yes. Now remember, this is just the beginning of a journey. It's not the end, it's a start. She's a newborn baby. And again, we love those little babies and we take care of those babies, amen? Each one of us here today has a very important responsibility. And that's to help her to grow. And when she slips and falls, we're there not to point fingers or knock her down, but we're there to what? Lift her up, encourage her, and strengthen her. And uh, uh, you need to remember that. You remember when your child took those first few steps and it slipped and fell? You didn't walk over that child and say, why, you idiot, boom, 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 and kick it? No, you put your arms around it, you lifted it up, and it wasn't long before that child was running all over the house. So again, remember that child is a child of God. You have responsibility. And God's going to use that Annie in a very special and beautiful way. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, again, it's a joy, it's a privilege to be in your house today. We come as sinners. We come as sinners and we lay our burdens and our sins at the feet of Jesus today. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for the privilege we have to come, to worship, to praise, to witness this beautiful baptism today. And so, Lord, again, I pray that if there are decisions that we need to make, that as your Spirit speaks to us, that we'll say yes to Jesus. That will leave this place, new men, new women, boys and girls in the blood of Christ. In his name I pray and praise. Amen. Amen. The time, A.D. 27. The condition of the world, it is sick. It's in an age of uncertainty, an age of transition, an age of doubt and despair. It's a period in, in history that was troubled it was, and it was restless. A society that was corrupt morally and spiritually. In fact, it was a time when all things were done away. It was an age when the world had grown old before its time. Iniquity had run its course. Philosophy was on the rampage. Crime was running rapid in the church and in the government. And there was no end in sight. It really was a generation of rebels. In fact, it was the darkest hour, the darkest hour in the history of the world. Israel enslaved to the Roman Empire. Israel enslaved in sin. Her religion was plastered with rites and ceremonies and rules and regulations. Her priests lost sight of the services they performed. Outwardly they appeared righteous, but inward they were as dead man's bones. They were like whitened sepulchres. There was a hardness of their hearts, a petrifying of all moral senses. Even the heathen would have felt that truly the fullness of time had come. It was time for a miracle. It was time for Jesus, the Messiah, to appear. Again, it was time for Jesus to begin his long journey to Calvary. It was time for Jesus to untie the apron string or pull the apron over his head and, and put it on the workbench in a small carpenter, uh, carpenter shop in Nazareth and head for the mountains. Head for the mountains and beyond to the heated valley of the Jordan to, where the, to there, where the man was sent from God. A man sent from God. His name was what? John. John the prophet of fire. Fire. Yes, indeed, it was time for another prophet. The prophet, again, the promise given to Abraham, the promise given to David, it still awaited fulfillment. We read in Luke, the first chapter, what should we got on here now? Nope, must have got that text. Well, I'll have to read it for you. It has it there on the screen, but I thought they were going to put put the text in, but I'll just read it. All right, listen to the text, Luke 1, 13 through 15. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Verse 14, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Verse 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. 
He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist. He is known as the prophet of fire, a gift from God, a gift to his countrymen, a gift to mankind. He is the forerunner of Christ. Again, the anointed one, the child of the promise, brought forth from Elizabeth's womb, Jesus' cousin. The word says, there's none greater than John. None greater than John. What a compliment, amen? Of all the individuals we read in the Bible, from Genesis unto Revelation, Jesus says, there is none greater than John. The word says he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. The word says he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, and great he was. Great he was. And what was it that made him great, John the Baptist? Let us see this morning. Let us see what really made him great, why he was great. Let us see this man who Jesus came to, who Jesus heard, whom Jesus was with. This man sent from God, the prophet of the highest, the prophet of fire. I want you to picture John. Yes, picture John as, he, as he's on, again, as he stands on the banks of the Jordan River. Picture John as he stands there, this man of fire, the prophet of fire. He stands tall under the burning Arabian sun. He is the last of the prophets. And he brings what? He brings hope to Israel. And he brings hope to us today. Amen? Israel, look at her. How sad. Israel, look at her. There is no king. There is no unity. There is no glory. For she is despised throughout the entire world. She's betrayed by her own priests, Israel. The glory that was hers for thousands of years. Look at her. It's gone. Look at her. She lies, what, in chains. She lies in, in chains, in slavery, in defeat. Oh, how Israel wanted victory over Rome. Oh, how she longed for resurrection and a return of victory in a triumph of God, in the coming of a Savior. You see, they wanted a liberator, a liberator. They wanted a warrior on horseback, a king, to rule Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, stronger and larger, more beautiful than that of Solomon's day. They wanted a kingdom to dominate all other kingdoms, like she had been dominated in the past. Israel, hating its masters, Israel. Robbed by its politician, Israel. Plagued in merciless Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees. Old Judea, divided, humiliated, plundered, yet in spite of its shame, in spite of its shame, Israel looked for the coming of a Messiah. So they came. They came to the banks of the Jordan River. In fact, it's interesting to note that all four Gospels said they came. They came. Crowds. Crowds filled the banks of the river. From priestly Hebron, they came. From holy Jerusalem, they came. From smiling Galilee, they came to hear John. He is the prophet of fire. We might say he's a preacher's preacher. We might say that John was the evangelist of all evangelists. He was the prophet of fire. And I can imagine the people who came to the riverbank to hear him. Have you heard? Have you heard his words? Have you listened to his sermons? You see, John broke the bread, the bread of God, and said, eat and live. He was no politician, that's for sure. No politician. You know, trying to make yes sound like no and no sounding like yes. You see, again, he was no little candle, no little candle in the sanctuary. He was a prairie fire, a prairie fire. With a stump or a rock as his pulpit, the sun, the moon, the stars as his chandeliers, and the Jordan was his baptistry. His baptistry. Did you hear him preach? Did you hear John preach? He used images like, like a, general, a general would use artillery. Strong, powerful words. Words that cut. Words like axe and tree and chaff and wheat and baptism. The king is coming. What was so powerful 
about his preaching? What was so powerful about his preaching that he put you in the presence of God? When he spoke, you felt like you were in the presence of God. There would be no passing of the buck when he preached. When he preached, there was no idle talk of the weather or other curiosities. There would be no running around the bush, no excuses, no blaming the pastor, the church, the teacher. He made you feel like you were in the very presence of God when he spoke. And they came, it said, all four Gospels, they came and they came. They came by the droves. Multitudes and multitudes came to hear John, the man of thunder, his voice crying in the wilderness. This revolutionist for God, Pharisee and Sadducee came. Scribe and soldier came. Saint and sinner, Jew and Gentile, they came. They flocked the shores of the Jordan to hear this man sent from God. Farmers left their plows in the field to hear him preach. The bakers left their bread in the ovens to hear him preach in the wilderness. For it was the home of the Baptist. It was a delight there in the wilderness for him. A delight from the noise and the meanness and the malignity of man. Among the barren hills and wild ravines, John would learn a lesson of self-denial. Self-denial. His textbook was what? The desert. And he would get his Ph.D. in nature. In fact, his whole life was a rebuke to the excess of his time. His life was not spent in idleness, no, or in ascetic gloom, or selfish interest. No, his whole life was in selflessness, something of which we who are living now know so little of at times. He sacrificed. He sacrificed so that he might reach the hearts of a people with a message. A message from heaven. A message from actually the throne room of God. A glorious mission was upon him to do what? To prepare the way of who? The Lord. So that his light, that his small, small light might be kindled into a self-consuming fire. Not for his glory, but for the glory of God. A light to illuminate the pathway for the coming King, Jesus Christ. It was a struggle for John. Let me tell you, it wasn't easy. In the prime of life. He was a young man full of life and full of vitality when, his, when he left his parents. But look at him as he stands on the banks of that river. He's a burning torch for God. He was a sermon just looking at him. Look at him. His hair was what? It was long. And when I say long, it was long. Not like the businessman in the office with his little ponytail in the back. No, John never cut his hair. His beard was long and never trimmed. His clothing was simple, camel's hair, and there a leather belt around his waist. I wonder, my friends, I wonder if John walked through our front doors today. I wonder if someone would go up and say, hey, you need to leave dressed like that. I pray not, and I don't think so, but I pray not. Pray not. And all might feel the warmth of Jesus here in this, in this church. Because my friends, this church is not just a building. What is important is you. You are the people. You are loved. I thank God it is a beautiful sanctuary. But what's important is you. That's what counts. It is you. But look at this man. Tall and tanned by the desert sun. Look at his diet. It was too simple. Locust and honey. Simplicity was his name. Simple in dress, simple in diet, simple in faith. You know what? It'd be good for all to get back to simplicity, amen? You see, again, again, he was a man sent from heaven, a gift to his land. Prayer, solitude, and simple faith. This is what fitted John for his mission of preparing a world for Christ's advent, first advent. And so I say to you, he, we here at Monroe, are we spending time in solitude and meditation? Are we spending time in prayer and witnessing and Bible study? Preparing our families, preparing our neighbors for the second advent of Jesus Christ. You see, this is what John lived for. This is what he actually lived for. This was his life. But what made John... 
What made John the man he was was his message. His message. And what makes our church, this church, this church is its message. Amen? And the message is the word. Amen? Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Amen? Not what the evangelist says or the pastor says, but what does the Bible say? That's what makes this church the church it is, is its message. His message did not come from the intellectuals of his day. He did not sit at the feet of the noted rabbis of his day. He did not get his degree from Andrews University of Vanderbilt or MIT. He did not get his message from the general conference. No, he learned the language. He received a revelation. And he spoke a message from above. It was a message from heaven. It was a message from God. And now he could stand. And he could speak to the people because he had been with God. Let me tell you, my friends, others can tell if you've been with God. They can tell in your smile, in your handshake, in your hug, in your hello. You see, he was not like the teachers of his day who stood proud and boastful with their broad paraphernalia and their golden robes, who spoke about smooth things and prophesied deceit who put everyone to sleep with their sugar-coated theology. No, that was not John. John would have no part in that. He was the prophet of what? Fire. Fire. And when he spoke, it was like thunder. His voice rang out with power. It rang out with conviction. He was the forerunner. He had a message from on high. And there's some that called him a madman. There are others that laughed at him. There were others that poked fun at him. But others, his words brought hope and peace and love. John saw how the people were deceiving themselves, and it troubled him. They were lost in self. They were lost in laziness, lost in their sins, and it troubled John. And I ask you today, each of us, myself included, does it startle us to see a word lost in sin, a nation, a neighbor, a family, an individual. It did John, and it showed us. His message was simple. A message that was simple, and it was direct. And it caused the people, as it said, they all came. They flocked to the riverside, and his doctrine was nothing new. But it was powerful. In fact, the Pharisees came to examine this new prophet in his message. The Sadducees came to find some error in his teaching. The soldiers came to find rest and peace. The publicans and harlots came to find freedom. Yes, freedom from their guilt, freedom from their shame, freedom from their sins. And I want to tell you, my friends, there's no greater freedom than to know that we are free in Christ Jesus. To know that when we go to him, that he hears us and knows that he takes us no matter what we've done in the past, no matter what we've said in the past, he takes it and casts it into the depths of the sea. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The watchwords of John were three words. Wow. Hey, we got it right. Three words. Three words. I really, I have more than three words. I think it's nine words, but there were three powerful statements. This is his message. Nothing really complicated. No. Again, repent. Repent. And I'm certainly glad that it's the Holy Spirit that caused us to repent. We can't repent on our own. We can't do it. It means a totally turn around. A metanous, the Greek word for repentance. Metanous. Meta meaning after. It's a preposition. Nous meaning the mind. It means we're going in the wrong direction. And the Holy Spirit touches us. And we repent. And he turns us totally around. We go in the right direction. I like that, don't you? It's his spirit that does it. Repent. And then the kingdom of God is at hand. My friends, the signs tell us we are near the end. Every day we see more signs so soon, soon Jesus will come back. And his last one, how appropriate is that beautiful baptism today? Baptism. Baptism. Wow. Three, did you notice the three dynamics? Three dynamics. Law, prophecy, and cleansing. Wow. Matthew 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, while they were living in Nazareth, John the Baptist began preaching out in the Judean wilderness. His constant theme was, turn from sin. Turn from your sin. Turn to God. 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. John is clearly telling all, I mean all, there's no other way to the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, there's no other way to the kingdom of God but through what? Repentance. Unless you repent. And faith we must have in the coming king. And then going down in the watery grave of baptism. To have your sins forgiven. And that's what took place. As Annie went down in that water, as, as Pastor Jenny shared, went down in that water, again she went down and then she comes up again new, like a newborn baby. Do you comprehend what John is saying? It's so simple, and sometimes we make it so complicated. Oh, you can't be baptized till you know this, or you know that. No, it's simple, it's beautiful. It's a step by faith, and yet so easily overlooked. John is saying, ye must be born again. You must experience the new birth. Now let me ask you, it's a little bit different today than it was when my children were born. It was a little bit different I'll never forget it, you know, you go into the hospital, and I remember very clearly that there's that window to the nursery. And, and you see all these men with their noses squeezed next to that big window. And they're all trying to figure out, <laughs> trying to figure out which one's their baby. <laughs> and they got that nose squeezed right against it. And, and again, each one trying to figure out whose baby is theirs. And I remember looking to see our firstborn, Jennifer. And I, and I said, she has to be the, the cutest baby in that nursery. I know she's got to be the loudest, that's for sure. <laughs> and so we kept staring and kept looking. And, and, and finally I kept seeing, hey, hey, there she is, that cutie pie. And then again I was there at that nursery when my daughter April was born. And I said, she's got to be the cutest and chubbiest baby in that nursery. She was chubby. <laughs> And, 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 and truly she was, and she was cute there, and, and it was, it was a, an experience, a beautiful experience to see this newborn baby. Then finally my son arrived, and I said, well, he has to be the handsomest baby in the nursery. He had to take after his father. Well, you might defer on that. <laughs> and, 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 and then, you know, you search, back then you would search for that little, little tiny name tag. You know, it's supposed to be where the arm comes down and joins the hand. But it seems to be lost in all that baby wrinkle, you know? <laughs> or lost on that plastic cradle somewhere, somehow. So you begin to speculate, oh, there, there he is, oh, there he is. And then finally, wow, there he is. That's my son. That's my newborn baby. Well, my friend, that's what John is telling us. That's what he's telling us today. That's what he's offering the people. Annie, newborn baby, a new life has begun. A new life has begun. And that's what John was telling the, those people gathered there on the banks of the Jordan River. He's offering that same gift to you and me this day. He gives us a chance of, of, of begin, beginning again. I like, I like, in fact, I love beginning again, don't you? When I slip and fall and make a mess of things, that he's there ready to pick us up. Not criticize us and point things at us, but pick us up and to help carry us on. That's what I love about my Jesus. That's what I love about my Jesus. The chance of beginning again. A new creation in Christ Jesus. Not in the water in the womb of a mother, but in the water of the grave of baptism. The water that cleanses, that cleanses, that washes away our sins. And that's the kind of water I love, don't you? cleansing water if you're thinking about baptism let me don't don't put it off don't don't procrastinate and, and say i've got to clean up my life first i gotta get rid of this i gotta get rid of that no you see jesus is in the business of cleaning up our lives not the one that sits next to us in the church or the elder or the deacon or the or the van no jesus will help clean your life up it's letting go and letting jesus have first place in your life but Jesus help you. You can't clean up yourself. He, he will do the work in you. The church can't save you, my friends. The Jewish nation fell into that trap. And you know, if we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap. Jesus says, don't, don't try and get by as you're thinking. We're safe. We are Jews, descendants of Abraham. 
That proves nothing. You see, God can change those stones into juice. That's what he says. You see, our passport in heaven is a new birth. It's beginning again through the wonderful saving grace of Jesus Christ. Yes, John, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Not only the kingdom, but the king of kings and lord of lords. His presence was near them. He was among them, but yet they knew him not. Sad, isn't it? They talk a lot about the sanctuary service and, and, and what a beautiful service it was, but everything in that sanctuary service pointed to who? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, yeah, they, every part of the service they, they conducted was, was showing them Jesus and what Jesus did for them, his sacrifice, and they lost it. But if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap, can't we? The same predicament, get so lost up in our rituals and our rules and regulations, we lose sight of Jesus. If we lose sight of Jesus, we've lost sight of everything, amen? Never lose sight of Jesus. You see, we have the light of the world. Why do we sit in darkness? We know the truth of God's word, and yet we sit in error. We have the right path led out before us, and yet we are lost. So again, here we see John. To John, King Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. And John was there to herald the light of the world. John, cousin to Jesus in humanity, but brother to Jesus in his humility. John was, John was spirit-led and spirit-fed. And yet it still led him to a cold and damp prison cell. Why? Wow. John would not compromise. John would not compromise. A palace in a prison cell would be his last pulpit. Can you imagine the scene here? Is this, this man, this prophet, this prairie fire? There in, in the palace of gold? What a contrast. Here's this camel-skinned prophet walking marble falls, oh, floors in front of the king. What a contrast. They're all dressed, you know, in fine linen. And then <laughs> King Herod makes a big mistake. King Herod asked John to speak. <laughs> and let me tell you, that was Herod's mistake. If he wanted flattery, let me tell you, if he wanted flattery, John was not the person to ask or to give it. It says, listen to his word. These are his words. This is the words of the preacher's preacher. It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. And before John could say another word, he was in chains in the prison. And soon his head upon a platter. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, he's more than a prophet. There hasn't, there hasn't, hasn't risen a greater than John the Baptist. Wow, what a compliment. And I say, great, why? Great not maybe in the way the world measures greatness today, by the size of one's brain or the size of one's wallet, <laughs> or by the size, oh boy, the clothes one wears or the size of one's home. No, God, listen, God measures greatness by the size of one's heart. Amen? Size of one's heart, bigness of heart. Bigness of heart. That's what counts with God. I'm glad he, God looks on the inside and not the outward appearance. God looks at our humility, our faithfulness to duty, and above all else, our willingness to do all that a master asks us to do. John offers what? A new beginning. He offers a new beginning to all who came to hear. And I want you to know that's what God offers us today here in this place. A new beginning. A new start. I remember very clearly growing up. Could you tell I, I do have a deep southern accent? I try to cover it up, you know, a lot. I was, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, so you'll forgive me. I was born in, so I say I'm a southerner. I was bro born in southern Brooklyn, Coney Island. <laughs> and I remember very clearly, we lived in a, in a fourth-story tenement building, and, and I'll never forget it. I remember going, sleeping there at night, and next morning, I guess the, the snow had fallen heavily that, during the night. And I remember looking out my window and, 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 and there, I'll never forget, as I woke up that morning looking out of that window, there was about a foot of snow in the alleyway. No more black, dirty soot. No ugly garbage cans. There was little mounds of snow over the garbage cans that were scattered throughout the alleyway. 
just a mound of clean white snow. And it was so beautiful. And you see, that's what really John is offering the people. He's offering us this today. Uh, 2,000 years ago, he offered it. He's offering us to now, right here in this place, to be cleansed, to be covered with his white robe of righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. And you know, it's yours for the asking. It's yours for the asking today. Some of you may be thinking, well, maybe I'd like to have a new beginning, new start. And rebaptism is biblical, it's beautiful. Or baptism for the first time. Or I don't know, maybe you want to rededicate your life today. There's no better time than the present. Amen? Amen. The thing is, if you want to be baptized and plan to like to be baptized, just talk to Pastor Jan or one of the elders in the church. They'll be glad to set up a date and work with you. But again, you need to realize, you know, you don't have to go through all these 50,000 studies and all this and get an A and this and A and that. No, God will bless you. He'll help you understand. But most of all, he's there to help you and he'll clean up your life. He's in the business of cleaning up lives. And then, let me tell you, there's nothing like the cleansing water of baptism. No, nothing better than that. Maybe you're not sure of your salvation. You ought to be sure of it today. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. Jesus says, I, Jesus says to you and me, I've covered your sins with my blood. My blood paid the price. You ought to know that your salvation is sure in Christ today. The king is about to come. Repent of those sins. Repent of those sins the king is about to come and say, Lord, I'm going to go in that watery grave of baptism and I haven't done it before. If I want a new beginning, there's no better way than that. If I want to recommit my life to Christ, there's no better time than right now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that are here today. And I believe that we are here not by, by accident, but we're here by your spirit, the beckoning call of Jesus. And Lord, we witness this beautiful baptism of this young lady who's already using her gifts for your glory. Continue to bless her, Lord. Put your arms around her. May she grow and be a mighty witness for you. I pray for each person that's here. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, Lord, if there's a soul here today that has never surrendered to you, never asked you to come into their heart right now, O oh Lord, as they invite you to come in, they know that you will come in because you've promised it. They know that you will abide in their hearts because you've promised it. We lay our sins at your feet today, O oh God. And we know that you take our sins and you cast them in the depth of the sea. And Lord, I thank you for the decisions that have been made, whether it's baptism or rebaptism, or whether it's to say, Lord, I, I want to start a new life with you. I rededicate my life to you today. Thank you, Lord, for your miracles in my life this day. Thank you, because I repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, and I've surrendered all to you. So now put your loving arms around your children today as we leave this place but never thy presence. In Jesus' name I pray and I praise. Amen and amen. Well, have a beautiful day. Sun is shining. Amen. And I'm resting. I've been moving. I'm, I'm glad I'm able to stand today. My daughter invited me just at the right time. But anyway, enjoy this beautiful, beautiful Sabbath day. God bless you. I just want to let you know um, that there was a house fire just up the road. Um, the house that, if you live up that way, you're not going home that way. So if you need to go left out of our parking lot, don't do it. You need to turn right. If you need to get up past that, you'll need to go down to the light and turn and cross over behind Safeway and, and go up that road and ch turn in at the farm. Um, we will be figuring out how we can best help this family. We've got contact information. Carmen and I just spent the last time with the family. Um, they lost everything. There are seven that live in the house. They have a nine-year-old whose birthday it was today. They were preparing for the party and they lost their puppy. So we will um, we'll coordinate efforts. Um, we've got contacts from my neighborhood and so we'll be coordinating the efforts and let you know how you can help yeah. just know that you will not be able to turn left so please turn right and find a different way home um, and keep them in your prayers if you want to know the children's names to pray for them specifically it is Valeria who is nine today it is Guadalupe who's 13 
and it is Mario who is 11. Valeria, Guadalupe, and Mario. So pray for those children. The two girls and grandma were home, and so they're, it's bad. It's just bad. So I had an opportunity to pray with them and to talk with the girls for a long time. So as of today, we've done what we can, but we will be helping them. The neighborhood is going to come together and help as well. So we will, we've told them about God's closet. We've got clothes that are sorted and ready to go if they need them today. They're going to stay with family. So just please pray for them. Um, and we'll let you know how we, how we can help. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And Annie, I'm so sorry I missed your baptism.